Ooh, my tea is done. All right, we're successfully on Facebook Live. Excellent. Um, we only have about 30 participants and I know many more registered. So uh, let's give folks a few more minutes um, to log in. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share uh, the title session here. Uh, we can just leave it on the screen for a couple minutes. Welcome everybody. It's great to see all of you. Uh, we're gonna give a, another minute or two uh, for folks to log in uh, before I get started with some housekeeping notes. Uh, so if you don't have a cup of coffee in front of you, you have a, you have a bit of time. We made it to 55 attendees. Uh, oh, and we're, we're still climbing. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, my name is Dr. Caitlin Reed. I am an assistant professor in the Native American Studies Department here at Humboldt State University. Um, I'm also a member of the Yurok Tribe, and I'm super excited to get to host and moderate uh, this panel today. Uh, this is the very first session of a speaker series that is entitled Decolonizing Sustainability, Amplifying Indigenous Perspectives and Transforming Sustainability Discourse. Uh, the goal of this speaker series is to highlight and unpack the intersections between colonialism, white supremacy, and systems of power, privilege, and oppression within the discourse and rhetoric of contemporary sustainability, environmental, and climate change movements. Uh, this series is intended to serve as a deep dive into problematic and harmful discourses of sustainability with the goal of moving towards a decolonial sustainability movement that amplifies indigenous sovereignty and experiences. Uh, we're at a critical moment here at Humboldt State University as we transition into a polytechnic institution and one that highlights the necessity of indigenous knowledge and stewardship. Part of this work necessitates understanding um, and deconstructing right, how white supremacy and settler colonialism continue to inform sustainability discourse. Today's session is entitled, We Have Always Been Scientists, uh, Western Science, Sustainability, and the Delegitimization of Indigenous Knowledge Systems. Uh, we are joined today by two amazing panelists that I'm incredibly excited to introduce. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Deepti Chati and Dr. Zoe Todd. I'm going to say a few words about each of you, but I encourage you uh, to, to say more about yourselves uh, before your presentations. Dr. Deepti Chati is an assistant professor of environmental studies and affiliate faculty at the Schatz Energy Research Center. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary scholar of the environment whose research sits at the intersection of political ecology, environmental justice, feminist and post-colonial science and technology studies, energy geographies, and South Asian studies. Her current research analyzes development efforts to expand energy access to low-income families in rural India. Dr. Chatti draws on her interdisciplinary training in the social sciences, humanities, 
natural sciences and engineering to understand the socio-cultural and political dimensions of global climate change. Uh, we're really excited to have you, Deepthi. Uh, Dr. Todd is a Mati Otempesa Squeo scholar uh, from Mishka Chiwaskaigen. Hope I nailed it. Well, uh, we'll see. Uh, she's currently an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. Dr. Todd writes about fish, art, Mati legal traditions, the Anthropocene, extinction, and decolonization in urban and prairie contexts. She studies human animal relations, colonialism, and environmental change in Northwestern Canada. Dr. Todd's work employs a critical indigenous feminist lens to examine the shared relationships between people and their environments and legal orders in Canada with a view to understanding how to bring fish and more than, the, and more than human relatives into conversation about indigenous self-determination, peoplehood, and governance in Canada today. So we have, a, we have a powerhouse of a panel today. Um, I have a couple housekeeping notes before we get to the really exciting stuff. Uh, number one, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists at the end of the session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. You'll click on that and put your question into it. Um, we'll try our best to get to all of them, uh, but you can put questions throughout the session and all, uh, Katie and I will keep track of those. Uh, recordings of this session will be available um, if folks want to tell everybody they know to watch it, uh, use it in their classes, what have you. Um, it's currently being live streamed to Facebook at the HSU NAS Facebook page. Um, so it will be there immediately after the session. We will also be posting this uh, session to our YouTube channel. We'll share the links in the chat in a little bit. Uh, third housekeeping note. Uh, one lucky audience member today will win a free copy of Vine Deloria Jr.'s book, Red Earth, White Lies, The Myth of Scientific Fact. Uh, to increase everybody's odds, uh, the winner needs to be present. So we'll spin until uh, one of the registrants is here and can claim their book. All right, I think that's all the housekeeping notes I have. Uh, next up is uh, our land acknowledgement. Um, if folks wouldn't mind, I would love it if you could let us know whose indigenous territory you are currently joining the Zoom call from. Uh, in the chat, you will find a website where you can find that information. There's also a phone number uh, that you can text your zip code to. Um, and so if everybody could share whose territory they are joining, from, uh, joining us from today uh, into the chat, that would be lovely. I also want to recommend folks uh, check out a lecture entitled What Good is a Land Acknowledgement by Dr. Kacha Risling Baldi, um, who talks about the, the politics um, and the, uh, the importance right, of a land acknowledgement. Um, to put it simply, if a land acknowledgement doesn't come with action, it is merely performative and thereby meaningless. Uh, here's my land acknowledgement. Humboldt State University occupies unceded land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Goudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods, was renamed Arcata by settlers in 1860. One thing I notice is people always put indigenous place names in italics. Uh, so I'm going to start doing that with all the, the settler towns uh, in, our, in our territory. Uh, despite this, Wiat peoples maintain connections to their territory through ceremony culture and stewardship, we at peoples are central to the history and future of this place. Um, as I said, land acknowledgements are meaningless without action. I know a lot of us in uh, the call today are students and I remember being a student and being very broke. So I have some free action items for you. Uh, number one, go follow the we out on Facebook. Uh, number two, then go follow us. Uh, we have a Facebook page, an Instagram account, and a YouTube channel. Uh, I love it when we get more subscribers. And all right, and all of you staff and faculty in the chat, <laughs> uh, you can uh, go to this link to pay the We Are Honor Tax. Um, you can also go to this link here to donate to the Rue Dallager Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workspace, uh, which we held our grand opening, uh, a groundbreaking ceremony for this past Friday. Um, so really exciting things happening at Humboldt State University. All right. So uh, before we get to our panelists, you get to listen to me talk a little bit longer. 
Um, our featured book uh, that really um, inspired today's session is the work of Vine Deloria Jr. and his book, Red Earth, uh, White Lies, The Myth of Scientific Fact. And so uh, I'm gonna say just a few words about this text and some of uh, Deloria's contributions um, to critical indigenous studies, right? And really the interrogation of the objectivity of Western science. Uh, well, no. I'll let you read that quote in a minute, but I'm gonna keep it hidden for a little bit. Uh, Vine Deloria Jr.'s work has been foundational to critical indigenous studies and laid the groundwork for future generations of scholars. And I, I completely include uh, myself in this category. Uh, with biting wit and humor, Deloria bravely challenges the scientific dogma that is packaged as neutral, objective, and fact. He begins the book with a reflection of his own educational experiences. Uh, he writes, growing up in a little border town on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, we all knew that we could never understand the complicated theories of science, literature, and philosophy that were common knowledge among sophisticated people in the cities. So we mostly didn't try. Sampling, uh, believing somewhere all the contradictions were resolved satisfactorily, at least in the minds of those more intelligent than we were, right? Um, and so he, he really reflects on the, the way he grew up, right? Believing that scientists held a monopoly on truth. Uh, and in this book, he really interrogates that claim. He writes, in our society, we have been trained to believe that scientists search for, examine, and articulate truths about the natural world and about ourselves. They don't. Uh, Western science, uh, as Deloria explores in the book, emerges from a particular demographic and geographic context. This body of knowledge has historically delegitimized or even purported to discover uh, the knowledges, indigenous ways of knowing and knowledge systems of non-Western peoples. Uh, from scientific racism that aimed to demonstrate the superiority of white people to beliefs that indigenous people were too primitive to travel by water, so they must have gotten here through the land bridge. Uh, these scientific doctrines contribute to the erasure of indigenous peoples and the delegitimization of non-Western bodies of knowledge. Uh, one of the tasks Deloria takes up in this book in the 1990s, I might add, right, um, is an interrogation of the land bridge theory. He writes, regardless of what Indians have said concerning their origins, their migrations, their experiences with birds, animals, lands, waters, mountains, and other peoples, the scientists maintain a stranglehold on the definition of what is respectable and reliable human experience. The Indian explanation is always cast aside as a superstition, uh, precluding Indians from having an acceptable status as human beings and reducing them in the eyes of educated people to a pre-human level of ignorance. Uh, what native peoples have maintained is that we are from this place. Um, now there's a ton of evidence coming out. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if anybody saw the breaking news uh, that NBC released a little bit ago. Uh, I don't know if you're here, Brittany, I stole your Facebook post. Uh, breaking news, everyone else finds out what native folks to this continent have been saying forever, right? Uh, I don't know if folks know, the land bridge theory was first articulated by like a Catholic missionary who was like, well, Adam and Eve are from this place. So, right, uh, they must have crossed the bridge. Um, new studies are continuously coming out that reaffirm what indigenous peoples have been saying about their origins in this continent for millennia, right? Um, what this aims to do, right, is erase complex societies with multifaceted histories um, to simplify indigenous nations as primitive hunter gatherers, right? or prehistoric, pre-Columbian, right? Um, and there's a, a lot of science, right, that happens in this big block of time here um, uh, that we think of as prehistory, right? Um, the next thing I wanna talk about briefly, and then I'll, I'll be quiet and let our amazing panelists speak. Uh, as we think about sustainability, indigenous knowledge systems, and environmental stewardship, 
right? Uh, traditional ecological knowledge has really become all the rage, right? I contend um, in line with Vine Deloria Jr., right? We cannot begin to integrate indigenous knowledge systems until we thoroughly understand and deconstruct the power dynamics that exist between them. Uh, and so as folks know here in California, uh, the world's on fire uh, and California Indians have been burning the landscape for millennia. Uh, but uh, the United States Forest Service uh, hasn't historically uh, thought too highly of indigenous ecological knowledge. Uh, I pull this quote from an amazing uh, PhD candidate at the University of Oregon, uh, Kirsten Vignetta. Uh, I don't know if you're here, Kirsten, but uh, thanks for doing this archival research uh, so I could share with folks uh, what you found. Um, this is a quote by Aldo Leopold in 1920. A little bit of context, um, the lack of tribal specificity used by government agencies um, is, is, is rampant. Uh, indigenous burning is uh, often referred to as Paiute forestry uh, by the US Forest Service throughout much of the 19th and 20th century. In 1920, Aldo Leopold writes, it is up to the public and especially the users of forests to decide whether they wish fire suppression policy continue or whether they wish to try Paiute forestry. It is, of course, absurd to assume that the Indians fired the forest with any idea of forest conservation in mind. The Indian fired the forest with the deliberate intent of confusing and concentrating the game. A bunch of deer with their heads in the air, waiting for a fire presented an easy mark, even to the Indian's bow and arrow. And it was this fact and not any desire for fancied forest conservation, which caused the Indians to burn the forest. Right. And so despite millennia of scientific evidence uh, by indigenous peoples that fire management was very useful uh, for a variety of reasons, whether food production, uh, eliminating a buildup of fuels to prevent catastrophic fires, um, the, the benefits, the thinking, the philosophy behind traditional ecological knowledge practices has historically been delegitimized and erased by settler colonial states. And so now we're in this moment where like, oh, burning is good. Ecologists have discovered we need to burn the forest, right? Uh, but till we understand how fire suppression and the legacy thereof is really an attempt at the eradication of indigenous peoples and the criminalization of indigenous knowledges, we can't come to a meaningful interaction, right? Unless we acknowledge this legacy and work to deconstruct it. And so, uh, lots of texts uh, recently have been discussing the, the importance and significance of the integration of multiple ways of knowing. Uh, and again, Deloria wrote this in the 90s, uh, totally seeing into the future. Uh, he, he shares this uh, in kind of a, a way for us to kind of conclude my remarks. Deloria argues two things need to happen before there's any meaningful exchange of views and knowledge systems between native people and Western science. One, we have to get rid, we have to take corrective measures to eliminate scientific misconceptions about Indians, their culture, and their past, right? Um, what Indians have been saying about our origins in this place, uh, right, are valid in their own right. And two, there needs to be a way that Indian traditions can contribute to the understanding of scientific beliefs at enough specific points so that Indian traditions will be taken seriously as, val as valid bodies of knowledge, right? There are value, there is value in multiple ways of knowing and multiple knowledge systems, but this requires reckoning with the power dynamics that exist, right? And that are continually reinforced through colonial ideologies. Uh, I'll leave this in closing. It is not up to Western science to validate indigenous bodies of knowledge, right? This model reinforces the superiority, right, of European derived knowledge systems. Uh, and so with that, uh, good luck to all of you. One of you will win a copy of this terrific book. I was rereading it this morning and uh, it's hilarious. Um, so it's a real treat. Uh, good luck to all. Um, all right, I will conclude my remarks now. Uh, the first panelist we're gonna hear from is Dr. Deepti Chati. Uh, let me stop my screen share here.
And you should have access to screen share and the floor is yours, Diti. Okay, um, can you see my slides and hear me okay? Okay, awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Caitlin Reed um, and Katie Kosiak for this wonderful organization of this event. Um, it's such an honor to be on the same panel as Dr. Zoe Todd, um, whose work I've admired. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Todd knows this or not, but I think we intersected at a previous institution when I was a graduate student before. So it's really an honor for me to be um, on the same panel as all of you. Um, my talk today is called Reimagining Energy Expertise, um, and this is uh, part of the Decolonizing Sustainability Seminar Series here at Humboldt State um, that the NAS department has put together, and I'm so excited about the rest of the events as well. Um, at the outset, I do want to say, um, just to be absolutely clear, that um, the word indigenous in India, which is the country where I'm from, has a very particular legal meaning. Um, and neither I nor the people that I do research with that you'll see you know, in, over the course of the next 20 minutes are classified as Adivasi by the state of India. And I think it's really important to be very explicitly clear about um, my positionality at the beginning um, as I give this talk. Nonetheless, when I discussed this with the organizers, um, it, they were really keen that I talk about the enduring col coloniality of the global north, global south relationships that endures within contemporary climate action. And so I just wanted to say that at the very beginning, um, so you get a sense of uh, where this talk is coming from and where it's headed. Okay. So um, my work in India broadly um, focuses on critically analyzing the epistemic, ethical, and empirical challenges of sustainable development projects that attempt to expand clean energy access in India. Um, and I'm particularly interested in um, sort of the two aspects. On the one hand, the targets of development interventions, essentially low-income rural women who cook on cook stoves that look like the photograph that you see in front of you, that's called a so-called traditional cook stove. Um, and then the development actors who are attempting to intervene in these home spaces uh, in order to achieve a variety of social, environmental, uh, and public health goals. So the broad questions that the development actors are grappling with is how to expand energy access and facilitate clean energy transitions and reduce exposures to air pollution in the context of climate change. Um, very briefly, just to make sure everyone's um, on the same page with regards to the broader um, health questions here, um, air pollution is known as a silent killer. This is a graphic that I didn't put together. I took it from the World Health Organization. Um, and you know, just to give you a sense of the gravity of this as a health issue, um, every year you have roughly 7 million people who die prematurely from entirely preventable deaths um, due to exposure to air pollution. Um, so it's a major environmental risk to health. Um, and the, the spatial distribution of these deaths, as you can see from the graph, uh, from the graphic below, is that it's predominantly in low and middle income countries where this mortality is experienced. So this is an environmental justice issue because these are preventable debts that low income, um, non elite people around the world are experiencing. And um, just to put that number in perspective, that 7 million um, from the first year of COVID-19, which is uh, an enormous tragedy all over the world, um, we had about 2 million deaths. And so you get a sense of like how many more times um, air pollution uh, is, is a, uh, a grave issue. And in India, where I do my work, air pollution is ranked as the number one risk factor by burden of disease. This is data from the global burden of disease in 2019. Um, and so a whole host of actors really um, have tried to intervene in this space. Um, and here's just a few perhaps familiar faces and names. So you've got international aid organizations uh, shown on the top left. You've got social enterprises shown on the right of the slide. So these are companies that are trying to innovate products and sell them to poor people in India. Um, and then as well as you have the Indian national government itself shown on the bottom left is a hoarding, a photograph I took in a petrol station. Um, it's a hoarding of an enormous uh, clean energy national program uh, where the government was trying to essentially um, target bottom of the pyramid uh, families and give them clean energy connections. So um, what are the, you know, I wanted to just give you a sense of the technologies we're talking about. Shown on the slide here is a whole number of technologies that come under the umbrella of so-called improved cook stoves. 
These technologies can be made of different materials. They use different energy sources. Some of them continue to use um, biomass or solid fuels. Um, so they continue to burn very similar fuels that um, so-called traditional stoves do. Some of them use very different fuels. Shown in the bottom left is a stove that uses electricity. Um, in the middle, you have a stove that burns LPG or liquefied petroleum gas. In the US, it's more commonly known as propane. So there's a whole kind, uh, you know, whole set of technologies that development actors are trying to get low income families to adopt and move away from uh, the way that they are typically cooking right now. So um, I want to tell you about how I did my research. It was a multi sided ethnographic study, and I had three major uh, sort of buckets of, uh, of research sites. Uh, one site were the individuals and families whose kitchens are the targets and sites of intervention. The second site were development actors like non-governmental organizations, state officials, and private companies. So these are all actors who are outside the kitchen, but very much interested in intervening within the kitchen. And then the third site are academic and policy researchers who are trying to make scientific knowledge about all of this, right? So these are people who study energy transitions in the global south, and they're writing research papers and books. Um, so the, you know, these are people like myself who are trying to make knowledge about what's happening and make sense of it all. Um, so my research was carried out across uh, geographically different places in India. Um, shown in blue are the different sites. And so I did roughly 18 months of multi-sided, multi-scalar ethnographic research across these different places. And because I'm interested very much not only in the development interventions themselves, but also the way that knowledge is produced about air pollution, exposure, and climate change in India. I ethnographically studied one particular transnational cookstove research project that was funded by a US federal aid, uh, aid agency, uh, I'm sorry, a US federal agency and an international aid organization. Um, so I was the resident social scientist on this project for about four years from 2013 to 17. Um, and I got to see through you know, weekly project meetings, uh, the way that we would uh, create survey instruments, the way that we would interact with our uh, community-based organizations on the ground, and the way that the project kind of unfolded, you know, through the messiness of fieldwork research, and then how that data was then sort of trickled up into, um, you know, evidence, evidence that would then be presented at conferences and then given to policymakers as ways to inform better energy, environmental, and social policy. Um, so I, now that you have a sense of sort of the way this research was carried out and the places and uh, people with whom it was carried out, um, I want to now shift gears and talk very briefly about something called the energy ladder concept. Now, the energy ladder is a conceptual model that um, uh, a lot of uh, folks in the sort of energy policy world uh, use, and the, la the, the ladder is kind of fairly straightforward. The assumption is that increasing wealth of individuals, nation states, you know, any scale, uh, that increasing wealth leads to a climbing up of the ladder. So shown on the right is a figure from the Global Energy Assessment of 2012. It, you know, it's just a conceptual model there, you can see. So at the bottom rungs of the ladder, you have fuels like crop, uh, crop waste, animal dung, and then you've got wood, charcoal, kerosene, LPG gas, and then ethanol. So as you, as you basically become wealthier, the assumption is that you start climbing up to the upper rungs of the ladder. Um, but most families that, I, that I've been doing um, extended research with in Himachal Pradesh in the north of India do not stop using old technologies when they adopt new ones. Now, this phenomenon is well known within the energy transitions literature, and it's called stove stacking. So it has a term everyone talks about, the problem of stove stacking. Um, and, and so what I find is that um, in rural Himachal Pradesh, multiple cooking technologies and kitchens are actually the norm. They're not the exception. And most people actually want multiple stoves, right? And so there are three main considerations that I want to talk about uh, with regards to why people want multiple stoves and multiple kitchens. The first is that there are pragmatic considerations to this. The second is that there are aspirational considerations to this. And the third is that there are epistemic considerations to this. And I'm going to go over each of these very, very briefly. I know we don't have a ton of time, but um, I just want to briefly talk about them. So the pragmatic considerations, first and foremost, is, of course, you know, everyone focuses on the cost of clean energy, the cost of LPG, the cost of electricity. And a lot of the families that we're talking about here are low income. They face um, economic duress for various months of the year. So, yes, obviously, anytime you have to go to a market based fuel, um, it's, it's, it's challenging for them. But there's also other pragmatic considerations like 
physical access during monsoons and winter months. As you can see from the photograph here, Himachal Pradesh is in the Western Indian Himalayas. It's a very mountainous uh, region and road access is really tenuous at all times of the year. And particularly during those seasons of the year when um, weather conditions make it very difficult, almost impossible to reach town um, you know, away from the villages. And so um, pragmatic considerations mean that you need to have various ways of being able to cook your food and heat your home that don't rely on continued economic and physical access to the nearby town. Um, and then third, you have difficulties in refilling your clean energy sources. So the way that the natural gas is actually uh, used in India is it's not piped in the way that, you know, you think of, say, here in Arcata or Eureka or in the Bay Area. Um, it's actually um, through a physical finite cylinder that when, when it gets over, you need to take that cylinder back into town and then exchange it for a full cylinder. So there's this concept of refilling your uh, clean energy once it's over. And there are lots of difficulties, um, social, economic, geographic, cultural, political in doing that. And I have a, a project right now that's try better trying to, trying to better understand what those challenges are that families face. Um, second, I wanna now talk about, sorry, Katie, go ahead. We had a few requests in the chat for you to go to the full screen mode for your presentation. Oh, if yeah, that's possible. sure. I can Thanks. do that. Sorry, I didn't want to cut off your flow. Thanks. That's fine. Is this better? Yes, I think okay, so. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for alerting me to that. I can't, I'm not seeing the chat right now because I'm just seeing my slides and, and um, the panelists. Okay. Um, so we talked about the, the pragmatic considerations. I want to now talk about the aspirational considerations. Um, shown here in a drawing is, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a dream home that my research interlocutors um, were, were making, uh, were drawing for me as part of my research. And um, you know, I'm anonymizing names here, but this is uh, Monica's dream home. And as you can tell in Monica's dream home, she's got multiple stoves and multiple kitchens. Kitchen one right on top, um, that has the um, you know, mud stove, the so-called traditional stove. You see a photograph on the top right. Um, and it, it also happens to be where the um, family and community deity resides. That's where Monica believes her deity resides in the topmost portion of her house. Um, and then kitchen two has a, a different kind of wood stove. Um, this stove is made of metal and it's used for the dual purposes of cooking and home heating in the winter. And then kitchen three at the bottommost level of the house has the um, LPG gas stove. Um, and then if I go to Shruti's dream home, again, this is a pseudonym to protect the anonymity uh, of the people that I'm doing research with, um, you similarly see um, multiple kitchens and multiple stoves. Now, um, Actually, what's most striking about Shruti's dream home is how different her dream home is from her actual home that she lives in right now. So Shruti currently only uses one stove and she has just one kitchen, which is the LPG gas stove. So to an external observer, it looks like Shruti has climbed the upper rungs of the energy ladder and has left her mud stove behind in the past, right? But the irony is that Shruti actually um, considers herself to be in a temporary period of hardship. And so the way Shruti talks about it is, you know, she says when she has a successful series of harvests from her crop and when she's doing well financially, she's going to rebuild her home and expand it and make home improvements. And she says, Hum achhe se banayenge, gas bhi hoga, mitti ka chula bhi hoga, tandoor bhi hoga. In other words, we'll build it well, there will be gas, there'll be a mud stove, there'll be a tandoor. So in other words, what I want to point out here is that the aspirations of a lot of people uh, in rural India are not to have just one stove and one kitchen, um, but it is to actually think of modernity as being assimilative um, rather than being sort of substituted. Um, and then the third thing I want to talk about are the epistemic considerations, um, which is that families use wood stoves because of their association with good healthful, healthful food and living. Um, and so in other words, what People, what is considered healthy is not determined solely by the particulate matter concentrations in the air, which is PM 2.5. Now, that is certainly one angle of health, but there are many others as well. And so um, we need to pay closer attention to the individual and community understandings of good cooking and good eating practices and their relationships to good health, um, for both for the individual, the family, and the community. Um, and so in other words, there are multiple conceptions of the purities of air, bodies, and spaces in kitchens. Um, and so what I'm working on a book project, and so what I thought I'd do is just pull out um, arguments from the book that are relevant to this particular speaker series and this particular set of conversations happening at Humboldt State right now. 
Um, and what I'm essentially saying is that we need to reimagine the way we conceptualize energy expertise in this moment in the contemporary climate crisis. So there are generally speaking two well-trodden paths when it comes to thinking about energy expertise, right? One idea is that expertise rests in elite sites in the global north, in the affluent global north, and it's only by uh, technology transfer that we can innovate our way out of the climate crisis, right? So in other words, um, people think that we need to innovate new technologies and new ways of doing energy things somewhere where we have labs and elite spaces, and then we need to transport those innovations to uh, sites like Shruti or Monica's homes uh, so that they can you know, benefit from the fruits of innovation. Um, and so in this worldview, corporations who sell energy technology to the bottom of the pyramid, you know, that work is seen as being climate justice or elite engineers from the global north who work on energy poverty. You know, this is also part of what is seen as climate justice, right? So that's one well-trodden path of thinking about it. The second path um, is, you know, which diverges from that, is to think about expertise as being local and traditional, that you know, uh, rural people are timeless and static, and that they're always operating against corporate influence, uh, corporate interests and elite influence, right? And so um, this sort of second uh, path assumes that forms of knowledge that are grounded in an embodied understanding of environments are always in harmony with nature. And then this considers techno science and engineering as being fundamentally Western and different from uh, knowledge that uh, is seen as being local and traditional. What I'm proposing in my book is that we reimagine this entirely. And so if we reimagine energy expertise, what I'm talking about are rural Indian women as energy experts who are deftly innovating technologies in the contemporary moment. Uh, and they're actively managing energy and mass flows uh, from their kitchens, livestock areas, and fields. Um, and so kitchens then are important sites for the traffic of ideas and people. And these are not static, timeless, traditional spaces, but actually highly dynamic places where experimentation and innovation is already taking place. Um, and far from being isolated backward bubbles, uh, which are the passive recipients of the fruits of innovation done elsewhere, they are actually the places where energy innovation is happening. And there's all kinds of different ways of knowing that are getting entangled here. And people are um, sort of using different ways of knowing, different ways of thinking about health, different ways of thinking about climate, different ways of thinking about energy, uh, and actively making decisions about uh, for their own health and for the environment. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I know it was kind of a lot of information in a short period of time, but I wanted to make sure to get through um, as much of it as I could. And um, I'm so delighted to be here and excited to um, answer your questions and excited to be in discussion with Dr. Reed and Dr. Todd uh, once we hear from Dr. Todd. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chati. Um, if folks have any questions about the presentation you just heard, um, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen um, and you can post your question there. Um, I see we got a couple in the chat. I'll keep note of those. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, next, we are going to hear from our second panelist, uh, Dr. Zoe Todd. Uh, the floor is yours, Zoe. Excellent. So I'm just going to share my screen. And there's no elegant way to do this ever. <laughs> Perfect. Can you see my um, PowerPoint? Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, Atansi Zoe Nitsigasun, Nia Odapem Suasqueo, Eguamaga, Eguamagua Snana as Qualicum, Niwigan, Ginanas Gomiti Noel, Masi Kekyo, Niwako Makinak. So, I almost introduced myself as living in the territory that I work in, not the territory I currently live in. So, I'm glad I got myself there. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Reed, Dr. Koselak, and Dr. Chatti for, um, you know, uh, welcoming me into this space. I'm so honored to be here today. And today I'm going to talk about fish. And this talk comes from a place of listening for years to the fish and waters in my own homelands in central Alberta, where Indigenous sovereignty is not always fully respected by provincial or federal bodies. And I draw from learning to see what is happening below the surface of the water, where things may not always be as they first appear. And I spent a very long time working in um, colonial conservation contexts where I've had a lot of opportunity to observe how settlers are kind of operating in these spaces. So I draw on all of that. Uh, and in this paper, I call for work in Canada that, that falls under the notion of what I kind of gloss as critical Indigenous conservation studies. And it's such a delight to be in a space where we can critically engage 
concepts of integrating Indigenous knowledge and Western science, because in Canada, which is you know a small L liberal nation by and large, uh, we're really under the regime of reconciliation at the moment, and critiquing these kinds of things is seen as um, you know being kind of like not a team player. <laughs> but I think that the impacts on Indigenous sovereignty are very real and and um, visceral, and so I'm so grateful to have a, a a welcoming space where we can explore this a bit more critically. So. Fish who have been on the planet for 510 million odd years have so much to teach us about how to survive and thrive on a planet in constant flux. Much of my work is uh, deeply influenced by Indigenous legal scholars and scientists who built space for my generation to join the academy. And today I'll open this talk with a quote from one such trailblazer, Kainai scholar, leader, and philosopher, Dr. Leroy Little Bear, who spoke about fish at a talk that he gave in Calgary, Alberta in 2016. So um, this is just my dad and I along the banks of the Kisiskechewan Sippy in the eastern slopes of the Alberta Rockies, where I currently am so lucky to get to learn from uh, uh, Stony Nakoda knowledge keepers and um, also scientists and others who are trying to protect fish in these waterways. Um, this is my stepdad, the late uh, Wayne Roberts, who was a fish biologist who fought very hard to protect uh, bull trout in those same waters. Um, and then this is just the Lake Winnipeg watershed that um, my Indigenous family has spent many generations within, but also where my settler family settled uh, and to which I have many responsibilities. So now we can uh, look at Dr. Leroy, Leroy Little Bear's quote a bit more closely. So at this talk, he stated, quote, Western science is largely aimed at exploration. Native science is aimed at sustainability. We exist in a very narrow gap, as we've mentioned. And the fish, for instance, nobody's talked about the fish in this Congress, not that I know of, but the fish has been around, think about it, way before the dinosaurs, way before the Neanderthals, way before our time. The fish is still around. I wonder what scientific formula the fish has discovered. We should ask the fish, they've survived. And what I really like about this quote is that he's uh, pointing us towards you know, the fact that fish are themselves scientists and that uh, there's things that we can learn from them, given that they have weathered multiple mass extinctions on the planet. So every part of Canada is a fish place and every indigenous nation in Canada has a deep and storied relationship to fish that informs local laws, science stories, language, art and existence. Fish are integral to Indigenous life in Canada, but fish communities across the country in both marine and freshwater habitats are in trouble. Although Indigenous knowledges were dismissed for many centuries by racist Western academia, and we can turn to the work of critical Indigenous scholars, Eileen Morton Robinson, Linda Tuhawai Smith, and Vine Deloria Jr., who we are thinking with today, um, all of whom have studied the devastating impacts of these racist characterizations of Indigenous knowledge upon Indigenous peoples. But in spite of this racist history, today, as scientists grapple with the realities of the global climate crisis and the sixth mass extinction event that might wipe out up to 75% of species on Earth, Western science is now incredibly belatedly turning to non-Western Indigenous people's knowledge systems for answers about how to come into better relationships with the planet and with non-human beings like fish. As a result, there is a growing body of peer-reviewed Western scientific work that demonstrates that Indigenous managed lands and waters are the most effective paradigms through which to protect species biodiversity. This work affirms long practiced Indigenous philosophies, legal orders, and worldviews that center reciprocal responsibilities, obligations, and protocols between humans and non human beings, including plants, animals, and landscapes for collective survival. So, in the work that I do with Indigenous and non Indigenous peers in projects in Canada, Australia, and Borneo, my colleagues and I critically engage this recent colonial academic and regulatory embrace of an interest in Indigenous environmental knowledges by arguing that Indigenous governance and law is, uh, is really the key uh, to understanding um, why, why Indigenous peoples are able to protect so many diverse ecosystems and homelands in the face of ongoing social and political injustice. So this is just some sort of material here that sort of shows you know, the extent to which, as Dr. Reed already pointed out, um, suddenly scientists are very interested in Indigenous knowledge and they've been in interested in it and sort of like copying Indigenous knowledge for a very long time. It's just that belatedly today, 
uh, people are starting, Western actors are starting to say like, oh, maybe we should be listening to indigenous knowledge keepers. And sorry, I just need juice. <laughs> um, and so the reason that we focus on governance and law is that these are the active ways that knowledge is mobilized in a society. So in other words, it's not just about knowledge and reconciliation as abstract liberal ideas, but also about the active ways that knowledge is mobilized in Indigenous societies through ceremonies, protocols, laws, stories, and relationships that are living, constantly reaffirmed through ongoing relationships within and between communities, and practiced in a rooted, immersive way by Indigenous peoples within our diverse homelands. So what my team and I are learning, building on our collective decades of experience in environmental conservation work and governance, is that Indigenous autonomy, sovereignty, and laws are key to protecting fish and waters here in Canada. And we draw on the work of people like Val Napoleon, um, who, who has done eminent work looking at uh, Indigenous legal orders, which is the practice of laws that are embedded in social, political, economic and spiritual institutions in Indigenous societies. And, and Indigenous peoples have had laws forever and Indigenous peoples have had science forever. And so our work tries to really acknowledge this. So many Indigenous legal orders around the world recognize fish, other animals, lands and waters and ecosystems as more than human persons or beings who are sentient thinking and who operate autonomously from humans. On the other hand, historical Western scientific and colonial management approaches treated animals and plants as inert or non-sentient beings, which fostered perceptions that colonial humans had dominion over animals, the environment, and over Black and Indigenous peoples, who were once categorized as non-human or not fully human in racist Euro-Western societies. These colonial conservation ethics were built on traditions of white supremacy, imperialism, capitalism, extraction, and control, and they actively coincided with efforts to eliminate, eliminate Indigenous peoples entirely from countries like Canada. So the critical Indigenous fish philosophy work that my colleagues and I do addresses tensions between colonial laws and worldviews and Indigenous worldviews by studying how Indigenous governance can complement, challenge, and shift the underlying assumptions that guide current fish species at risk work uh, and legislation and environmental policy in Canada. What I'm learning from working with Indigenous knowledge keepers in watersheds across Canada is that when Indigenous peoples and communities are honored and supported to be strong, autonomous, and healthy, the fish are also strong, autonomous, and healthy, and vice versa. There's a great need for platforms, programs, and approaches that truly support Indigenous communities to tell our stories uh, about fish, about watersheds, about science and Indigenous governance in our own words and on our own terms. So building on my time working in Ottawa in the colonial capital of Canada and in settler political environments, I want to make a gentle intervention for settlers coming into Indigenous legal and scientific spaces right now. There's a growing popularity in environmental conservation spaces in Canada in recent years by settler governments, academics, and environmental nonprofits to adopt a partnership, integration, or reconciliation approach to conservation issues. These approaches, while laudable, attempt to remedy historical injustices of Indigenous land theft and erasure in environmental policy through what Elizabeth Pavanelli and Glenn Coulthard would call the politics of recognition which is to say they locate the problem of Indigenous erasure and dismissal of Indigenous environmental knowledges in the problem of a lack of inclusion of Indigenous peoples and worldviews in colonial institutions such as universities, governments, and regulatory bodies. These integrative approaches, as I call them, attempt to repair colonial harm by including Indigenous peoples in existing colonial management, conservation, and environmental governance systems that are slightly altered to make space for Indigenous perspectives. These approaches, while commendable, struggle to navigate the underlying structural violences that countries like Canada are founded on. For settlers, it's really important to truly address these underlying structural violences, as uncomfortable as that may be to confront, before assuming that you have the tools to start enacting allyship and repair. As the late Australian anthropologist Patrick Wolfe argued, settler colonialism, which shapes Canadian society, is built explicitly on the deliberate elimination of Indigenous peoples through genocide and the subsequent replacement of Indigenous peoples by the settler colonizer and settler institutions. 
I'm just having what uh, I think the memes call a petite attack d'anxiety. <laughs> and I think it's because the ideas I'm trying to bring forward, like this is something I really wrestled with for a long time. And, um, you know, I've had like funding applications denied because the work I do isn't integrative. And it's, you know, it's impacting the capacity of communities to assert their sovereignty. And so it's like a little scary to be presenting this to the world. So I apologize, but I've got my juice and I'm gonna keep going. Um, but, you know, further indigenous scholar, Eileen Morton Robinson, drawing on her experiences in settler colonial Australia, argues that settler systems are driven at their core to own and control indigenous worlds, peoples, lands, and livelihoods. We have seen the outcomes of these colonial drives to control, eliminate, and replace Indigenous peoples demonstrated powerfully in recent months and years by settler Canada's reckoning with its genocidal legacy of residential schools, land theft, displacement of Indigenous peoples through forces of houselessness, and also through police brutality against Black and Indigenous peoples. On the surface, these issues may seem to settler audiences to be disconnected from ecology and environment, but when we look at them through the lens of Indigenous sovereignty and law, and through the lens of environmental racism, they are all interconnected with the need to recognize and affirm Indigenous relationships to lands and waters and more than human beings, and to address histories of white supremacy and genocide. For reconciliation to work, we must address these underlying injustices that shape Canada's relationships to Indigenous lands. Drawing on generations of critical decolonizing advocacy here and internationally, and indeed the opportunity to think with the great Vine Deloria Jr. is one of these you know, uh, traditions to work with. We are invited to pay attention to how colonial systems and governments still try to control the narrative, even when they claim to be reconciling or integrating indigenous knowledge in good faith. So mere recognition, integration, and inclusion of Indigenous peoples by and into colonial systems cannot by itself overcome the deep drive by colonial institutions to own and control Indigenous lands, waters, and peoples. Even with the best of intentions, colonial systems are designed and driven to control Indigenous peoples and erase Indigenous sovereignty at a great cost to people and the environment. In short, we must pay attention to local and global questions of decolonization, sovereignty, inequality, capitalism, white supremacy, and imperialism. And we need a real commitment to return lands and waters to sovereign Indigenous peoples before an integrative or reconciliation outcome can really be enacted in an accountable way in a country like Canada. By this, I mean, we need to look more closely at claims being made by settler academics, nonprofit organizations, and regulatory management bodies that assert that the answers to fixing Canada's genocidal environmental legacies lie primarily in concepts like reconciliation, braiding knowledge, two-eyed seeing, or integration of Western and Indigenous knowledges. While these proposals all have a role to play, perhaps, we need to really make sure Indigenous sovereignty is fully respected by settlers before these approaches can meaningfully help in freshwater fish conservation. The ongoing land back conversation in Canada and the, U the US, which advocates for the return of stolen lands to Indigenous peoples, shows us that the full material return of lands and waters to Indigenous nations and to dispossessed peoples globally, and deep conversations about white supremacy, decolonization, and racism here and internationally are critical to reshaping Indigenous state relations in Canada, in Canada and subsequently building the reciprocal relationships needed to repair and restore environmental harm that Canada has allowed to happen across the country for generations. So just a concept we're trying to advance in our work, drawing on lots of brilliant people, uh, is to remind scientists that there are plural Indigenous sciences, there's not just one singular one, uh, and to be very careful about trying to apply that kind of homogenizing approach to Indigenous knowledge into these remedies to uh, what you know, Western governance has done to the land. So recent successes in asserting Indigenous laws and sovereignty as the basis for conservation objectives in marine and coastal contexts, such as politics, Anginiakvia, Nikikium, Marine Protected Area, the Tsleil-Waututh Environmental Review Process of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and Tanker Project grounded in Tsleil-Waututh law, and Mi'kmaq fishers' assertions of Mi'kmaq law to govern lobster fisheries on the East Coast, 
Show us the power of movements to center Indigenous law, sovereignty, and governance as the driving force, not an afterthought or compromise for freshwater fish protection mandates across Canada. So Indigenous peoples must be able to enter into fish and wildlife conservation negotiations from truly equal footing with settler Canada. In other words, when Indigenous law and sovereignty are centered, all other aspects of community well-being can follow, including environmental well-being. Canada claims to be in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, but Indigenous and non-Indigenous legal scholars show that underlying and unsettled legal questions about how Canada came to assert sovereignty over Indigenous lands and the subsequent nature of what nation-to-nation -nation means in that context remain unanswered. So these unresolved nation-to-nation -nation sovereignty and territorial questions must be addressed in order to build long-term solutions to many urgent policy issues, including freshwater fish governance and conservation. So my colleagues and I tend to these complex issues by asking how paying attention to fish and listening to fish and working with stories with and about fish can help to build meaningful responses to Canada's failed management of stolen Indigenous lands, waters, and atmospheres historically and today. At the end of the day, we invite settlers to come into these relations in ways that decenter colonial ego, disrupt extraction, possession, uh, and the ongoing drive to eliminate Indigenous peoples and our legal orders and sciences, and instead invite settlers to step into relationships of integrity and justice. So I think I'll end there, um, but really just thank you for creating this space to explore that a little bit. And then here's just some of the, the work that like we're doing while we're working with fish art, we're creating uh, digital fish worlds. And, um, and it's just so exciting because it's creating these capacities to imagine, you know, different ways of organizing within lands and waters and, and really enlivening and supporting Indigenous law. And so my beautiful uh, intellectual soulmate, uh, uh, Amar Kangi, sir, who I've been writing with now for uh, almost two years, they do this beautiful work on listening. And they are a settler scholar from Australia who works with Indigenous um, you know, water and land defenders in the Pacific. Uh, they currently have a really powerful project working with um, a Pacific Action Network uh, in Fiji. And uh, Amar's work is all about listening and uh, from a settler perspective, learning what it feels like in your body to gain consent to be in the land and to work in the land. And I love the way that they articulate it where they sort of say from a from a settler perspective, it's not their place to know the stories of the land that Indigenous peoples hold and carry story and work with. But it is their responsibility as a settler to understand whether the land um, wants them there or not. Uh, and to just work like the register that they can work at as a as a settler who's sort of in this like very emergent like baby stage of coming to understand the power of the lands that settler colonizers have stolen uh, is to just really focus on consent as the first step. Do you have consent to be there? Um, and this comes through really powerfully in their work where sort of it becomes very clear that when they've taken steps of obligation and protocol to respect the places that they're working in and, and have explicit permission to be there, um, they're able to do these beautiful recordings of like mangroves and different sort of uh, uh, coral coral reefs and things uh, that they're able to share with knowledge keepers to help knowledge keepers sort of know what the state of of their homelands and their waters you know are in and that work is just really inspiring me and so we have this concept we've been working with of moving from case study to kin studies which draws on all sorts of indigenous scholars that we're so lucky to think with um, but it, as someone from alberta where the alberta oil sands or tar sands are I became really concerned that the tar sands were starting to be mobilized by, see, by people who don't honor um, any kind of like obligation to those lands as kind of just like a case study they could throw in to um, environmental and energy and you know petroculture discourses. And we just wanna remind people, especially settlers, explicitly settlers, 
um, you know, that you can't just take stories from a place and drop them into papers um, without attending to your responsibility. So I don't want to take up any more time, but just thank you. And thank you for riding out that panic attack with me, which I haven't had one in a long time. Um, but when I'm presenting new work, sometimes it can be, it can be a little bit overwhelming. My friend Selena calls it when the aliveness is too much and your body can hardly contain it. Um, but just thank you for creating this space. And I hope that these thoughts uh, add to our conversation in a, in a positive way. Again, on a school meeting. Oh my gosh, that was, that was wonderful, Zoe. I, <laughs> I loved it. Uh, I loved it. Um, wow. I just want to thank, so thank you both very, very much for your incredibly insightful presentations. Uh, Deep D, I love the way you highlight uh, rural women as energy experts. Um, I think I, I was thinking about a lot of parallels uh, within our context here in Northwestern California. And I was, um, as you were speaking about, right, these women as experts, but ultimately kind of like scapegoats, right, for, for climate change and air pollution. I was thinking about how the state of California put a moratorium on Indian fishing uh, in the Klamath River, because it's like, well, those Indians are the reason uh, salmon populations are declining. It's not because we constructed a bunch of massive dams. It's not because we have a commercial industry trawling the ocean floor, right? It's these Indian fishermen uh, that are at the root of the problem. Um, and so I was, uh, I saw so many wonderful parallels between your research context um, and here locally. Zoe, I loved how you talked about fish as scientists. Um, I'm going to have to make an edit in one of my book chapters now uh, <laughs> and uh, use that argument. I loved that. It got me thinking a lot about how Western science really enforces this idea of human superiority, right, as a way to justify, like, it, it's used to justify violence against Indigenous peoples, but then also used to justify violence against more than human relatives. I was thinking about my time in grad school at UC Davis, uh, where there were still like studies going on while I was there, like, can animals feel pain? Can animals think? Can animals have emotions? And I'm just like, oh my god, what a primitive science. <laughs> um, and so I, I really loved that. Um, Thank you both. We have several audience questions that I want to make sure uh, we get to. I can talk to you guys uh, whenever. So we'll prioritize uh, what folks in the audience want to talk about. If you have a question that you haven't put into the chat or the Q&A, uh, please uh, do that. And hopefully we'll have time to get to your question. If you're joining us from Facebook today, uh, feel free to put a question in the comments. I'm keeping track of those. Um, and so we have a couple questions about your presentation, Deep D, that I want uh, I'll, that we'll start with today. Uh, Amelia really wants to know the name of your book uh, so she can get it as soon as it comes out. Um, but we have uh, the first question I'll ask will be: uh, People are really interested in taste. Uh, so Morgan asks: Is there a change in the taste of food um, that may contribute uh, to what type of cook? strategy uh, folks use. Uh, Haley wants to know if the use desire for multiple stoves also relates to taste. Um, does a traditional stove uh, change the taste of something people are, are used to? Um, and so people are really interested about food and taste. Thank you. Um, and I just want to first um, express my deepest um, appreciation and admiration for Dr. Zoe Todd's presentation. It was just fantastic. And I was scribbling notes uh, and, and you know, thinking with um, what you were saying in such a different context and going back, Dr. Reed, to what you were saying about one of the things that's really exciting to me about being here at HSU is the ability to think about connections and tensions and solidarities with very different kinds of literatures. Um, and I've just been, you know, my mind is blown by the amazing work that's happening in the critical indigenous studies world and um, how it seems like there's like different conversations happening, but there's so much in terms of um, intellectual intersection points that I really want to um, grapple with. So thank you. Thank you all for doing the amazing work you do. Um, uh, my book manuscript is a work in progress, Amelia, but I'm so delighted uh, that you want to get the book when it comes out. Uh, it's provisionally titled 
changing hearts and minds uh, in rural India, improvement, energy access, and environmental justice in the context of climate change. And it's changing hearts as in like a hearth, you know, like a cooking cookstove hearth. Um, but it's also sort of very much about changing hearts and minds because um, a lot of the development work is uh, predicated on this idea that we need to sort of transform people, uh, these backward peoples about the ways in which they cook their food and they don't realize they're so bad for their health, it's so bad for the environment, it's so bad for everybody, I can't believe they're still doing that. So there's that sort of discourse that I'm really critiquing. Um, I'm so glad that so many people wanna know about taste because this is one of the most uh, interesting things about, well, food is about taste. Food is not simply about putting energy to ingredients to transform them into calories, right? That's a very sort of utilitarian way of thinking about food, but food is about so much more. Food is about taste, it's about family, it's about community, it's about uh, life in so many ways. And so um, you're absolutely right, is that different cook stoves, different fuels, different ways of cooking make your food taste different. And that's absolutely a part, you know, you, if you think about our kitchens, your kitchen, my kitchen, you know, the way we cook our food has so much to do with what will taste good, right? And so you cannot separate ideas of taste and ideas of food as being so much more than uh, sustenance, right? Food is also culture. So um, you're absolutely right in that all of the conversations around energy transitions that are focused on cooking energy need to understand and grapple with taste and culture and what food means to people beyond just calorific intake to keep them alive. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do get into this in another part of my book. I didn't today because of time constraints, but um, you're right. I mean, there's a way that, you know, think about a wood-fired oven, right? Think about, say, a pizza cooked on a wood-fired oven versus a pizza cooked on a gas oven. It tastes different, right? And so, so that's absolutely part of the conversation. I'll leave it there just because I know there's so many questions um, for on other topics as well. Yeah, you got me thinking, like, eating salmon uh, cooked traditionally, right, on sticks. Like, you, you can't do better than that. <laughs> um, excellent, thank you. Um, Zoe, I wanted, uh, uh, we have an anonymous uh, uh, attendee that has a question for you. Uh, they want some advice because uh, mm -hmm. they, they really loved what you said about getting consent from the land, right? Um, I'll, one of uh, Vine Deloria Jr. actually talks about in his book, he's like one of the like critical tensions, like one of the things we really need to hammer out is like when it comes down to it, the like re the relationship to land through Western science and Western epistemologies is that land's dead, mm -hmm. right? It's an object, it's property, mm -hmm. it's real estate, right? And so like coming from the perspective that land is alive and it is something that can give consent, um, I think is kind of groundbreaking for a lot of uh, scientists when they first like engage with that thought. Uh, but our uh, the question is, uh, what advice do you have for a first step settler? Mm. to ask for consent from the land. Um, also, we have a question from Amelia. How can we as students who had upbringings in Western education be more intentional through uh, this listening that you talk about uh, with your intellectual soulmate? I'm gonna use that phrase. <laughs> right now. I loved it. <laughs> I love Amr with my whole soul. They're such a brilliant person. <laughs> So, and, and when I had COVID, they kept me alive. Like they would just, they were in Australia and like through the night when I couldn't breathe would just be on, um, you know, like on WhatsApp video with me, just like talking me through it, you know? And like, so like, man, that, that's a, that's a intellectual relationship forged in the fire. But, um, you know, what I learned from, what I learned from Amr is it's about this sort of like embodied work. And, and we don't want to be appropriative of like embodied practices that other cultures practice, but that like, I think the first step for a lot of settlers is actually being able to come into your body and actually like fight that Descartes, like the Cartesian dualism between your brain and the, in the world around you. And so Vanessa Watts thinks about this with her concept of indigenous place thought. Um, and then, so like being able to kind of like uh, recognize that you are a human in a fleshy body that you know, has reactions to the world, might have a panic attack in the middle of a talk at the worst possible time. And it's just like, there's, you know, there's stuff going on. And so really, um, and the academy is not the place that really recognizes that because we are just brains in bottles and we are expected to perform at increasingly ridiculous levels, you know, that are just like impossible to actually meet. 
And so part of it is the embodiment and coming into relationship with your body. And like for settlers, that means like explicitly healing any kind of trauma you have from the broken world orders so that you're not projecting that onto indigenous people you work with. That's like one thing I always tell settlers, like deal with your stuff. If you have access to therapy because it's covered by your employer, please go do that. You know, if you don't have access to that, like please find ways that are appropriate for you to really work on yourself so that you can come into like a, a healthy, effective, and like, you know, like mutually productive relationship with the people you want to work with, including the land. Um, and, you know, and I think also learning whose land you're in, um, reading publicly available material. So I really liked how Vine Delore at the beginning of the book, he talks about how where a story was shared with him by an elder, if there was a public version available, he would defer to that. And so like I tell settlers, like you're allowed to read the stuff that's published, like, you know, like, and especially if someone like, like Vine Delora Jr. says, I, I'm doing this in this ethical way here, you can see how it's ethical. So I sort of encourage people to go like read the literature and, and don't read the stuff coming out in 2020 in nature. <laughs> like that's just fine, but go back to the 60s. <laughs> like people have already thought about this, um, you know, and so then, you know, once you've kind of done that background work, then you can look at like whether it's your employer, a university or a government, you can sort of like look at what relationships that place has with the local nations and kind of build it from there. But um, and this isn't a one size fits all sort of approach like Amar works in the Pacific and in Australia and I work in Canada and we're not here to tell people, you know, how to do this elsewhere. But I hope those are like kind of some tangible starting points. But I think, you know, Amar does these sound and listening workshops for settlers. And they ask people like, can you just like sit in silence and listen to the world around you for five minutes? And, and people sort of like try it and they wait back and they're like, I couldn't do it. And so Amr's like, well, you have to start there. <laughs> like you have to be able to sit and just like actually, and it it's it's surprisingly hard work. And so um, if, if I think I can just sort of like impress that. Uh, so that was the first question about how to come into land. And then what was, there was another second good question. Oh, where, for students. I think both of them kind of connect like, and so what I try to teach my students, we are an unceded Algonquin territory in Ottawa, we're parliament, the Canadian parliament, there is no treaty for the lands that parliament is built on, we are in a place of just abject erasure and violence towards Algonquin peoples. And it's not, it's, you know, it's settlers who have created those conditions of violence, but there are, I also appreciate how Vindalera Jr pulled like no he had no compunctions about critiquing I guess what like Fanon would have called like the petty bourgeoisie of like the 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 native bourgeoisie who participate in recreating the structures of oppression without the same access to power and resources that the settler uh the colonizer bourgeoisie has but you know in Ottawa there are a lot of settler and non-Algonquin indigenous folks who are pretty actively erasing their sovereignty from that space. And so what I'm trying to do, like just really gently and thoughtfully is have my students like think about it, what it means to be in relation to the Kitchisibi, which is the Ottawa River watershed and think about what it means to be in this campus that was gifted to the university by, you know, a settler in the forties who just happened to have like a land, a, a big parcel of land to give away. And just that really slow, gentle work of realizing like learning in Ottawa is different from learning in uh, New York, which is different from learning elsewhere. Trying to just get people to really hone in on like the places we are, are specific and unique. And that's kind of where I try to start, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I hope those were helpful. Super helpful. Um, I love that you were, when you said, uh, you don't need to go read something in nature. Um, <laughs> Uh, what Katja always says to people is uh, decolonizing methodologies has been out for 20 years now. You don't have an excuse. Right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, it is my dream to someday publish in nature because I did a science degree and my one of my professors was like, you're not graduate school mat material. And like, I just, uh, there's an egocentric part of me that's like, I want to publish in nature, but there's another part of me that's like, that's so irrelevant. It's the relationships you build that matter. So like, I think we're all susceptible to flights of ego, but, but yeah, we, but just, right. <laughs> I think we all have lines on our CV that were born out of pettiness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I wanna 
Um, we had a lot of questions. I apologize if we did not get to your question, but our panelists are very busy people. And I know you all have a lot of stuff on your plate today too. Uh, we've come to the moment you've all been waiting for. Uh, we're about to give away a free copy of Vine Deloria Jr.'s Red Earth, White Lies. Um, oh wait, well, let me make sure my audio is on because I have a great sound effect. Uh, all right, let me full screen. Uh, <clears throat> Good luck to all the panelists. We will spin the wheel until we have a winner that is currently present. Uh, so good luck to all. <laughs> Woo. Congratulations, Tara. Uh, are you present today? Yeah, I, I see you in the participants list. Yay. Excellent. Congratulations, Tara. You have won a free copy of Vine Deloria Jr.'s Red Earth, White Lies. Uh, if you could send us a message uh, to the panelists with your email address so we can contact you about giving you your book. Uh, congratulations. I hope you enjoy it. It had me laughing on my sofa uh, this morning as I was rereading. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, the recording will be available on our Facebook page. Uh, as soon as I hit stop recording, um, it'll also be available on our YouTube channel. You can find the links for both in the chat. I hope to see all of you next Wednesday. Our second session will be called Nobody Asked You, John Muir, uh, Settler Colonial Environmentalism, White Supremacy and Sustainability, uh, featuring Dr. Sarah Ray and Dr. Heather Punchetti Daly. Uh, see y'all next Wednesday and happy Indigenous Peoples Week. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, all of you. That was really beautiful. Thank you. I just want to express that. Just thank you for holding space. <laughs> oh, happy to. I... Oh.